uh, where we're going to see the tax system design and tax revenue collection in the context of South Africa. Uh, we are going to have three uh, presentations, and then after that we are going to have uh, the discussant who is going to, to bring up the, the new common idea about all those representations. Maybe a couple of things before uh, we just have the first presentation. Uh, my name uh, is Emma Brensarimana. I am a research fellow at UNU WIDA. I am working at the uh, SA Tide program uh, based in South Africa. Uh, just a, a little bit introduction about this session where we are going to see the tax system design and tax revenue collection in the context of South Africa. So much is known about the South African economy where we have uh, issue of unemployment and uh, inequality. This is most common critical issue in South Africa. And this problem has uh, a big implications in terms of the development, in terms of the job creation, in terms of investment, and there are some other issues like road shedding and others. All this has massive uh, negative impact for the development. And the policymakers in, in South Africa they try to, to bring in some different programs so that they can make sure that they can have different revenue services, including uh, domestic, uh, internal domestic revenue mobilization. This is why different programs, research uh, development, have been you know, putting in place to be able to help the policymakers to have a concrete and efficient ways to collect tax revenues and help the to minimize the economic loss in the country. Uh, in this session, we are going to have uh, the first presentation by uh, Professor Nadine, who is the director of the Institute of Public and Regional Economics at the University of Monster. She is also the one of the work stream lead at SA Tide program. This is the, 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 the program we have, uh, a tripartite program between National Treasury South Africa Revenue Services and UNU WIDA, where the, the tax data lab, secure data lab was established at the National Treasury in collaboration with SAS to bring in those big data sets and to help the researchers to provide relevant evidence-based research. So Nadine plays a key role in the development of one of the work stream on the uh, domest uh, domestic revenue mobilization. Welcome, Nadine, for the presentation. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here and to present you um, a new paper that we um, uh, currently develop in the context of this um, essay type program that Imabla just um, mentioned, and it asks the question, what happens when you tax the rich? And it's evidence from South Africa. So um, background and motivation for the study is that in general, when you look at less developed countries, there um, uh, tend to be in many of those uh, rising levels of um, income inequality and that has sparked in these societies discussions about uh, potentially increasing the tax levies on high income earners in these countries. And if you think about the implications um, of that, that type of policy reform, then the promise that this holds is that you may um, increase revenue collection in these countries and many countries struggle with low tax to GDP ratios and simultaneously may reduce after tax inequality. The downside, of course, is that there may be efficiency costs, um, and these efficiency costs may be high, especially in lesser developed countries. Um, why? Because high income earners may have many options to evade and avoid um, taxes. Um, commonly, these countries are characterized by lower tax enforcement capacity than more developed um, economies. And uh, if you think about real responses, so here you tax potentially the very high high income, very high skilled individuals in the society, if they reduce their labor supply or their effort provision, that may have real economic consequences that may potentially be more detrimental than what you see in equivalent uh, developed countries. So if you think about the responses of taxpayers to this type of policy reform, it's really first order in terms of importance um, for policy discussions, whether you want to do this type of reform to understand how taxpayers react. And this is the, um, the context of the study. 
So we look at South Africa, and South Africa in uh, 2017, um, so in February 2017, the government announced to increase the top marginal tax rate um, in the personal income tax scheme from 41 to 45%. Um, percent. And this treated the very upper end of the income distribution. So the 0 0.5 top income earners in the country were affected by this reform. So income earners or incomes above 1.5 million rands were, were affected. And the government said what we want to achieve with that reform is ex exactly what I, I just gave you in the motivation. They wanted to raise revenue collection from the personal income tax and they wanted to decrease after-tax inequality in the country. And the question is just, did, did that work out? Um, so to give you a bit of context, what you see here is a graph that plots you on the vertical axis the top marginal tax rate of countries, so each of these acronyms is a country, and on the horizontal axis the gross domestic product per capita, and what you see is there's a positive correlation, so better developed countries tend to levy higher marginal tax rates on income earners, presumably because they have more tax enforcement power or better systems like in terms of third party reporting that just helps the, the tax revenue authority to really enforce um, these high um, top marginal tax rates. And South Africa is the red dot and what you see is that um, even before but more clearly after the reform the top marginal tax rate was quite high or is quite high for a country of that development stage. So um, in terms of which um, uh, individuals were affected, so the reform, as I just um, said, affected the very top end of the income distribution. In total, a bit more than 80,000 individuals were affected by this reform. This is a small fraction of the total taxpayer population in the PIT system, but this population contributes a massive fraction of the total revenue um, collection, so 22%. So it's 0.6% or 0.58% of the individuals that are treated, but they in total contribute 22% uh, of the personal income tax revenue collection in the country. So this is arguably relevant from a revenue um, collection perspective. So what we aim to do in this um, research paper is in a first step to understand in a broad way um, what these individuals did. So they were treated, they faced a higher top marginal tax rate. And the question is how did their tax income reporting change because of that reform? And this is very um, difficult to identify empirically. So if you think about it, then one quick approach might be to say, okay, I just look at changes in income reporting of these treated taxpayers relative to some control taxpayers that have lower levels of income and are therefore not treated. And the problem, and this is what you see here in this graph, is that the income trends are very different at the upper end of the income distribution and at the more lower or in the middle of the income distribution. So what we see in South Africa and, and other countries as well is actually income trends that are reflected here in this graph. So you need to understand the graph. So on the um, horizontal axis, it's just the income level. And on the vertical axis, it's the income trend. So how does the income trend over time correlate with your income level at a certain point in time? And the correlation is actually negative. So if you focus on the blue graph, and it's also negative in South Africa, what we observe is that at the upper end of the income distribution, the income trends are smaller um, than at the lower end of the income distribution. And the reason is mean reversion. So we have a lot of mean reversion in the data. So people may in one year have a very high income, and then the, they revert back to the mean um, in the next year. Yeah, and so what you see here is these underlying income trends are very different at the upper and lower end of the income distribution. So our empirical identification strategy now, um, uh, what we do is that we say we take a pre-reform period um, to identify the blue line. So where there was arguably no change in the PIT system and there, that um, period we use to model differences in income trends at the upper and lower end of the income distribution. And then we look at the reform period and this is what you see here in red and in the reform period the reform effect kicks in and what we would expect is that um, individuals at the upper end of the income distribution may actually reduce their taxable income reporting because of this tax shock. Um, okay, so this is the, the strategy. 
And what we use in terms of data, it's uh, the universe of personal income tax returns from South Africa for the years um, 2011 to 2020. And this information combines the actual PIT returns, so um, the, the tax returns that the individuals submit, and pay information submitted by employers, yeah, so third party reported income um, information. And as dependent variables, we use um, two um, income concepts, a broad income concept and then actual tax taxable income after deductions that the tax, uh, personal income tax system allows. So what you see here is just pure descriptive revenue collection in the PIT system in South Africa across tax years starting in 2011 until 2020. So the blue line gives you overall um, PIT revenue collection and the red line gives you revenue collection from the treated taxpayers. Um, so taxpayers above 1.5 million rand income. And the reform, so the first treated year was the year 2017-2018, um, which is indicated as 2018 in my graph. And what you see is looks pretty flat. So what we had is we experienced this increase in the top marginal tax rate. But if you just descriptively look at the data, this does not show up like in a take up in tax revenue collection from this uh, group of, of taxpayers. So here in this um, table in the first um, line, you see the number of individuals that report income above 1.5 million rand over time. And if you look at this line and um, the first, um, th this number, then you see it goes up until 2017. And then the number of individuals with more than 1.5 million rand of income tends to drop. And the second line gives you how much um, taxable income do these individuals report, and you equally see a drop in 2018, which already descriptively points to a taxpayer reaction, yeah? that they might reduce their taxable income in response to the reform. So here again, you see the graph with my empirical identification design, and here you see the estimates um, from South Africa based on the real data. So the blue lines, again, to understand the graph, so on the um, horizontal axis, you see the taxable income in a, a pre-period, and taxpayers with more than 1.5 million rand of income, they are treated. And the blue line um, gives you a pre-period, so in the base, this is the period between um, 2012 and 2015, so it's always a three-year gap in taxable income change of taxpayers in different percentiles of the income distribution. And what you see here is there's this declining trend that I also theoretically show you, driven by mean reversion, that we see in the blue pre-period. And red is the reform period. Yeah? So um, this would be the period between 2017, so pre-reform, until 2020. And the tax year 2020 is not affected by COVID. Yeah? So this is prior to, to the COVID outbreak. And what you see is that in the, we call that validation region, so taxpayers below 1.5 million rand of income, these um, curves overlap. So you see that the income trends are very similar in the pre-reform and the reform period. And uh, in the treated region, so taxpayers that were treated by the reform, you see that these curves diverge, which is suggestive of a response of these taxpayers to the reform. And this is broad income. And you see the same type of pattern if you look at taxable income and account for deductions in the tax system. So this translates, and this um, slide is more for the academics in the room, this translates into a, a substantive elasticity of taxable income in the South African economy. This um, elasticity of taxable income tells you if you increase the net of marginal tax rate by 1%, by how many percent does the taxable income in, uh, reporting increase? So here we need to think in reverse, it was like a reduction in the net of tax rate, by how much does the taxable income in your economy um, is reduced? And um, the first, this is again talking to the academics in the room, the first column is a reduced form estimation, the second column is an instrumental variable estimation where we instrument the actual change in the marginal tax rate that taxpayers face by the policy-induced change, by this uh, policy reform, the increase in the top marginal tax rate. And this elasticity is very high, yeah? So um, that means that these taxpayers reduce their income by 10%, yeah? So around um, 10% in the, in the treated region. 
So now you may have concerns about this approach and may say, okay, perhaps something else happened. Perhaps there, you know, there are just changes in these underlying trends over time at the top end and the lower end of the income distribution. And in the paper, so I, I, like one strategy to, to avoid this type of bias is just to look at so-called placebo tests and say we look in the pre-reform period and just in the pre-reform period ask ourselves over time, do we see that these, this red and the blue graph over time, does it change? And we do not see any systematic changes over time in the pre-reform period, which kind of substantiates that what we see here is really a reform-driven effect and driven by the, by the increase in the top marginal tax rate. So what the graph that I showed you initially already suggests is that this response increases across the treated taxpayers. So what you see here is this is only the treated group and this tells you what is the elasticity of taxable income, so how elastic do they react to the reform across the treated regions in deciles. So the upper, the 10, would be um, individuals in the very upper decile of the treated region. And what you see is they respond more strongly the higher up their income is. Yeah? So high income individuals um, um, within the treated region respond more strongly. And then one, <clears throat> one, one thing we are really excited about um, in this project is that the richness of the data really allows us a bit to dig into how do these taxpayers respond. So here we see a response in overall taxable income. And of course, kind of the question is, how do they respond? Is this in, in which income component is this evasion? Is this avoidance? Is this a real response? And of course, for the country, it's very relevant to get an answer um, um, to that question and how to think about this policy reform. So what you see here is just the distribution and the composition, and not the distribution, sorry, the composition of um, income earned by these top income taxpayers. So 1,500, this is um, the 1.5 million RAND individuals. And what you see is just what type of income do they earn? And normal income would just be IRP5 income, so pay income. Yeah, reported by employers to SARS, net of um, in yellow allowances and an orange fringe benefit. So this is also reported by the employers. What we were um, kind of, what we found interesting is that these income earners, they um, report relatively little business income. This is different in other countries. So at the very upper end of the income distribution, you commonly see higher fractions of income earned by business income. So we, we still want to dig into that. So we haven't, haven't understood that very well, but um, this is like interesting descriptively. And investment income plays some role at the upper end um, of the income distribution. But again, relative to normal income, it's like not um, huge, huge. Okay, um, so here this might uh, be one of the most um, interesting tables, at least to me, from this paper. Is So here we um, look at responses in different income components, and the first line gives you responses in pay income, so IRP5 income, net of um, fringe benefits and allowances, and you see kind of a moderate response. So the elasticity is 0 0.26 or 0 0.41, which is which is a response, but not like massive. It's not the one that we saw in overall taxable income. Yeah? Um, then in the next line, you see gross income of these taxpayers minus this third party reported employer income. And there you see like a massive response. So the, the response is driven by income that is not covered by third party rep uh, reporting or even remitting of, um, of the employers. Business income does not show a response. So business income does not play a major role and we have not, I think we need to look um, deeper, but if we look like in a plain way, we do not see like a massive response of business income. We see a quite substantial response of investment income. We see a bit of a response in deductions. This is actually quite interesting in the study per se. We find a strong response in broad income as well as in taxable income. And this may relate to the design of the South African personal income tax scheme where deduction, it's relatively simple with relatively few deductions. And so um, deductions are commonly perceived to be one and how taxpayers respond to these types of reforms. And what we see is even in a system which is very lean with relatively few deductions, we see a strong taxpayer response here in this um, context. And uh, fringe benefits and allowances also respond quite a bit. This allowance response um, uh, 
is uh, driven by different types of allowances. There's like one category, other allowances. This drives this a bit. And um, yeah, so this, um, yeah, so this is like the, the main uh, takeaway here. So um, this is the top of the income distribution and shows you like the, the, the last interesting finding I can convey for today and shows you in terms of if I only look at the income that these individuals report, how it is, uh, is it actually composed between monthly income, so that is the income that individuals get every month, um, and annual income, this is in red, and this would be bonus payments or incentive payments. So this is payments that people get like once a year and then commission income. And this um, graph is in to show you that this annual income, um, so bonus and incentive income is quite important at the upper end of the income distribution. And if we check how these income components react, we see essentially nothing in monthly income and a quite substantial response in annual income. And this is um, consistent with prior findings in the literature that suggest if these very top individuals face higher tax rates, they may reduce their effort provision and may not be as successful in achieving their targets within the firm as before. And this means that might be a real response that you see in the economy. Yeah, so asking, is this like avoidance, evasion, or is this a real response? I guess this is the result that most looks like a real response in our study. And then we link this to the firm side. So essentially what we say is if they really show this type of behavior, then it might end up showing up for the firms as well. So we basically match our personal income tax returns to the corporate income tax returns and look at the fraction of taxpayers within these firms that are affected by the reform and then ask ourselves, do we see like a reduction in output and activity of these firms? And the good news is there are not many firms treated in the economy. So it's um, in terms of at least having one taxpayer that is treated by the reform, it's only like 1.5% of the firms that are treated. Um, and we see a bit of a reaction, which is quantitatively relatively modest, however. So this would be sales of firms um, of different size in the economy that are treated. And um, we have different treatment indicators, um, the fraction of taxpayers that are treated, um, or whether a, taxpayer is, um, a firm is treated at all. And we see like a mild reduction, something like a 3% reduction in output um, in response to the reform. So, this looks a bit like a real response. It's arguably quantitatively not massive, but I think so. What we, what we think is um, interesting here is that you see the richness of the data that allows you to, to track these types of reforms and also control for confounders. Of course, you may think these firms are very different that are treated from other firms, but we can absorb like differences in industry trends, differences in firm size trends here, and still the um, effect uh, shows up. Okay, then you can think about what happened to revenue um, collection and inequality in the country. So this would be revenue collection. So what you see in the upper line is if the taxpayers would not respond to the reform, so static, just the marginal tax rate increases, what is the additional revenue collection that you have in the economy? Um, then you would um, collect um, around 8 billion rand more in taxable income. But we see this massive response by the taxpayers, which essentially suggest that uh, South Africa collected less revenue because of the reform, because of the strong reaction. What about inequality? Um, inequality may have dropped. Yeah? So here you see the Gini coefficient in 2017. If you just um, account for the tax change, the drop in the Gini would be from 0 0.626 to 0.618. And if you again account for the behavioral response, you get an even stronger reduction in the Gini coefficient, you need to keep in mind that not all of that is plausibly a real response. Much of that is avoidance or evasion. So this might just be reported income inequality, not actual income inequality. However, if you think there are evasions or avoidance costs, and if you think about consumption inequality, that may have dropped. Yeah. So um, summing up, so what we find is that taxpayers responded quite substantially to that reform, we see that the response is centered around income that is not subject to third-party reporting with the exception of this incentive and bonus pay. Um, it may have some 
had some mild repercussions on the real economy and likely it did not increase revenue collection in the country. Okay, thanks for listening.